Buenas queridos participantes. We would like to extend a warm welcome to our webinar on protection and promotion of human rights in mental health. My name is Katerina Molek. I am a mental health consultant at the Pan American Health Organization, and I will be facilitating the today's session. Before we begin, we would like to go over some technical aspects of the webinar. The webinar will be conducted in both Spanish and English with simultaneous translation, and we will be switching from Spanish to English between uh, along the webinar. You can access to have interpretation, and that for you have to click on the icon below that says interpretation or that has a, um, a shape of a small world. And if you want to make some questions at the end of the webinar, you can write them in the icon that says chat. I will shortly present the today's agenda. I hope you can already see it. And we will firstly start and begin with the welcoming words from the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit, Dr. Renato Oliveira Sosa from the Pan American Health Organization. Then Olivia Cano from Cara, Paraguay will share her experience, her lived experience with us. Following Dr. Fahmi Hanna, Technical Advisor from the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit from the World Health Organization will introduce us to the approaches on human rights in mental health and psychosocial support. Next, Carmen Martinez Viciana, Technical Advisor and Regional Advisor of the Mental Health and Substance Unit from the Pan American Health Organization, will present us the course on protection and promotion of human rights in mental health and psychosocial support. Then we will have a presentation from Karina Rodriguez, specialist from the Virtual Campus Public Health from the Pan American Health Organization on the campus. And lastly, we will have the presentations on tools and resources on protection and promotion of human rights in mental health. And of course, at the very end, we will have some time for questions and answers. Saying so, you can see that we are having a very tight agenda. Um, so let's begin then now with our speakers and panelists. So I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Renato Oliveira Sousa, the unit chief from the Mental Health and Substance Unit from the Pan American Health Organization. Dr. Renato, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. Uh, welcome, colleagues. Uh, let me extend a, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us uh, in today's webinar on protection and promotion of human rights in mental health. This webinar is dedicated to addressing one of the most significant challenges facing public health today, which is also a reflection of the reality of a significant part of our collective human history. People with mental health problems offer, often suffer from stigma, discrimination, and inequalities in various areas of their lives, as education, employment, housing, and social services, as well as the violation of their rights. Discrimination and stigma can create a barrier that prevents people from seeking help, which is a serious problem in healthcare. Providing care that upholds the rights and dignity of individuals is crucial in the mental health care setting. However, individuals with mental health problems are often subjected to harmful treatment practices, violence, neglect, abuse, and reclusion. In extreme situations such as humanitarian crisis, psychological and social suffering can escalate, heightening the risk of human rights violations. In this regard, PAHO advocates that countries comply with human rights international conventions by promoting and protecting the human rights of individuals with mental health problems. This can be achieved through a comprehensive, person-centered, rights-based 
and recovery oriented approach, which ultimately aims to improve people's quality of life. In this webinar, our aim is to present and promote the human rights protection approach in mental health. This approach is primarily based on the WHO Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan 2013-2030 and the PAHO Policy for Improving Mental Health, approved in 2022, along with reference documents such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We hope that this webinar is of great use and interest to all of you, and we greatly appreciate your commitment to the topic. We are indebted to people who suffer from mental health problems, and it's necessary to take joint and comprehensive measures by governments, services, and societies to protect and promote their rights. Thank you very much again for uh, joining us on this journey to rebuild better mental health in the Americas uh, in the, and in the world. Uh, I, re I really wish you an excellent uh, event. Thank you. Um, I will switch then now to Spanish and um, so now we're going to make a couple of changes in the agenda because one of our presenters unfortunately is not here hopefully she'll be able to connect a little later therefore let's move on to share the video of dr fahihana who is um, a technical advisor at the who on mental health and in the realm of um, human uh, services and uh, mental health services in the context of human rights. The doctor can't be with us this morning, but he has submitted and sent this a video to share with us. I will now share the video. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Fahmi Hanna. I'm a technical officer at WHO Department of Mental Health and Substance Use at WHO headquarters in Geneva. I'm also the co-chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Reference Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergencies. I'm talking to you today while I'm on duty travel in Odessa in south of Ukraine. That's why I really apologize for not being able to be with you in person live at this important webinar. Allow me to share with you today some reflections about mental health and psychosocial support and human rights. Let me start by reading to you an extract from a bulletin from the International Committee of the Red Cross, which was published exactly 20 years ago. International Committee of Red Cross staff visited the Rashid Psychiatric Hospital in the east of Baghdad, where the situation was found to be very bad. Following the last visit by ICRC staff on 8th of April 2003, violent fightings took place between the US and the Iraqi forces near the hospital. Between 9 and 11 April 2003, of looters descended on the hospital, burning everything that was not. The hospital director reported that some patients have been raped on 10th of April. 1,050 patients fled the hospital. Only 300 patients have so far given their living conditions are there. The hospital lacks sufficient drinking water. It has no water for washing, meaning it's extremely dirty and only is available for patients. Need to be completely renovated since the warehouse wards, references, workshops, and all been destroyed. This human rights that happened years ago in Iraq, it's not in today's emergency. I've seen it in Syria, seen it in Libya, I've seen it in, in various forms, including human rights, 
سيونان هناك وفلفلمنت فنس وبيب ريزاين سيكاتريك Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was developed through the UN General Assembly in 1948 includes human rights in all internal human rights and instruments and clearly identify right to health. The following convention that was developed by international human rights legislators also applicable to right to health and attainment of physical and mental health. The International Convention on Economic Social and Cultural Rights, General Document 15, then followed by that, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. All these conventions have highlighted that there is a room for the state, the state, the government, to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights of all people living on earth. Means governments need to make sure people living on their lands enjoying the highest level of health by, for example, ensuring equitable access to care. Protect means government need to make sure that people living on its land does not have violation of their human rights, including by other parties, for example, private companies. Fulfill means government need to do their duties to make sure that actually legislation, resources, trainings, measures and guidance are available in place and being implemented to ensure human rights application. General Comment 14 of the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has further identified what we mean by right to health. Right to health means available, accessible, acceptable, and of good quality service. Available means equitable access, closer to where people live. Accessible include also the concept of affordability. Acceptable means culturally acceptable, and of good quality means applying evidence-based principles. Colleagues, all that apply to mental health and psychosocial support. Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is known to be a paradigm shift for rights of people with disabilities, including people with psychosocial, intellectual, and cognitive disabilities, has also several articles relevant to mental health and psychosocial support. For example, Article 11, which highlights the rights of people with disabilities, including with psychosocial disabilities during the right to health for people with disabilities, including people with psychosocial disabilities, and Article 5 of the Convention of Persons with Disabilities, Article 26, right of, uh, of rehabilitation, and rehabilitation, Article number 7, right to protection from inhumane and degrading uh, trees, which which can be seen in a number of inter-residential facilities people with disabilities, social and cognitive disabilities. When it comes to the goals, documents, and guidelines, and for mental health, psychosocial support in emergencies, it was including international human rights and humanitarian. Interagency Committee Guidelines on Mental Health and Psychosocial clearly states that one of its underlying is human rights. Human rights and mental health and psychosocial, regardless of the gender, age, geographic location, race, religion, affiliation, have equitable access to mental health and psychosocial support. Section 6 of the guidelines talk about access to mental health and psychosocial support with healthcare, and clearly, I like this to be done based on intimate consent and equitable access, including integration of mental and psychosocial support through primary healthcare to reduce stigma and enhance access to people as equal to people with physical, with physical. Um, or the minimum observation of mental and psychosocial support in emergency built by C guidelines clearly identify human rights as one of the principles. Quick sphere, the sphere handbook 
clearly identify rights one of the principles, align the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And it's important to mention too that here with mental health and with its health section has mental health components. Well, its standards protect and promote the rights of people within the institution. Make sure also that they achieve the basic needs during emergencies. Allow me to share with you another point. One of the documents about the most common human rights violations as described by people with mental health conditions in several low and middle income countries. Arrange it here, as I'm going to say them, in a pending frequency. First, exclusion, marginalization, and discrimination in the community. Denial or restriction of enjoyment of rights and opportunities. Physical abuse and violence. Inability to access effective mental health services. Sexual abuse and violence. Arbitrary detention. Denial of opportunities to marry or to find a family. Lack of means to enable people to live independently in the community. Denial of access to general health care medical services. And finally, financial exploitation. Please allow me to come back to the topic of protection of rights of people within facilities, within institutions, including psychiatric institutions, and provision or ensuring that their basic needs are provided during humanitarian emergencies. As we heard from the story in, in Iraq, that was critical during the Iraq war 20, 20 years ago, but still very relevant during the Syrian war. I remember around 10 years ago, when I visited one of the psychiatric hospitals at the front line, one of the key needs I identified when I visited the psychiatric hospital, which was at that time in, in, a, in almost stage between the government and opposition forces, one of the key needs I identified was actually the lack of access to clean water. When I came back, I had to coordinate with the colleagues in the WASH cluster to make sure the facility is, re is receiving good supply of water. Similarly, in Ukraine, in the first days of the war, one of the biggest concerns of the humanitarian community was this large institutions in Ukraine. Ukraine has some of the largest and longest stay in institutions in this part of the world, including more than 200 psychiatric uh, facilities with more than 30,000 residents. What concerned the humanitarian community here in Ukraine during the first days of the war was actually the availability of food. If the staff has to leave the country and move, become refugees to escape from the war in the first day, many, many of them must run or seek protection and shelter for their life. There is need to sustain basic needs, including food, water, medical needs for the, the residents inside the psychiatric hospital. There were many volunteers, including nurses, doctors, who were living next to these facilities, ensure the continuity of supplies of basic needs at these facilities. And one of the priorities now, not only the deinstitutionalization, which is running in the country by establishing community-based mental, mental health services, which is again, one of the rights enshrined within the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disability, but to ensure people in these institutions, during the response to the ongoing war in Ukraine, are having equal access to the humanitarian aid provided to people outside the institutions. Finally, colleagues, let me also share with you that WHO is currently uh, adapting together with partners from Doctors Without Borders and Humanity and Inclusion and the International Federation for Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, its quality rights package for promotion of uh, human rights at mental health uh, facilities. We are adapting it to the context of humanitarian emergencies. It will be tested and piloted, and we hope that it will be tested and piloted as well in the PAHO region to ensure the protection of human rights at psychiatric facilities. Colleagues, to to, to end my intervention today, let me highlight that all our tools and guidance from the IC guidelines to, to, to SPHERE, to the minimum service package, have at its core one of underlying principles is the human rights. And finally, let's remember that within the vulnerable group of population, which can be wide and can be also varied from one emergency to another, let's make sure that in humanitarian response, not only we ensure equitable access to mental health and psychosocial support for all based on human rights, but also we do not forget the most vulnerable in the institution and make sure they have equitable access to basic needs like the people outside the institutions. Thank you.
Bien, un, un muchas gracias desde aquí y virtual a Fahmi Hanna. Well, very many thanks from here, Mr. Hanna. And thank you for your human rights approach in situations of emergency. We understand that the video was not always of the best quality for transmission, but we would like to let you know that we are going to upload the video on the website on mental health of the Pan American Health Organization. This being the case, and now seeing that Olivia Cano has joined us, we will now give her the floor. Olivia Cano is a forestry engineer and a mother, and she also is a user of mental health services. And she's a survival of psychiatric processes that have violated her rights. So without any further ado, we now have Olivia. Olivia, thank you very much for sharing with us. And so you have the floor now. Good morning. Can you hear me? Well, thank you very much, Caterina, and thank you everyone for being here. I would like to speak a bit on my experience. My experience as an adolescent, both in private and public services for psychiatric care and the violation of my rights. And this has to do with the violation of the rights of children as well as violation of human rights. But I'm not so much going to refer to the violation of rights because it is something you are all familiar with. I want to talk about internment and the isolation of patients, isolated from family, workplace, school. And I think that this is what most affects the patient when hospitalized. And so after I left the hospital, I understood the violation of certain rights because a number of things are lost. And these are rights that we don't learn about. We're not told what our diagnosis is, what the treatment will be, what's involved with medication, at least in my experience. And another issue has to do with those who are hospitalized for a lengthy period or many hospitalizations, often there are institutions um, very often there are many patients in psychiatric institutions. And so these are the points that I wish to emphasize. Now, once outside of the hospital, after being hospitalized for a year and a half, and by then I was an adult. And so then there's a question of joining the community. And this is very difficult because of the stigma and how the community stigmatizes the person coming out of the hospital. And so we're at a very low point then. Our self-esteem is very low when we come out of the hospital. And in my case, it was very difficult to go back to my studies and to rejoin the family and friends, go to a workplace, have one, one's own family. I have a 15-year-old daughter. But this is all difficult because there is so much discrimination, even from one's family. And even to the fact that one become a parent. And so certainly support is needed for the family because the, one's family still sees one as a crazy person. And this goes on for many years. So this is why I wish to emphasize the workshops 
the workshops are very important for patients, for everyone involved, and even for the press. I think this is an important involvement from the press because very often we see news about those who are using mental health services and all too often the press takes this news as being somewhat sensationalistic. Now I know many of you are involved in mental health, but I think that when one is a student, it may be somewhat easier, but once somebody has concluded studies, one has more firm ideas, but one has to understand the experience. So for me, the workshops are extremely important. And I did mention the media already. I don't know if Pajo has any workshops that focus on the media, but I think it would be important to do this. I know that there are many emergency situations and conflicts in the world today in Paraguay. We have had situations of emergency, but we also have a mental health situation, which is extremely important to be attended to. And even political situations are very much linked to mental health in Paraguay today. So I would hope that there can be workshops in Paraguay and Latin America. This is the region I'm familiar with. Also important beyond the workshops is to promote self-help groups. And I think that's very important for those who wish to use mental health services. And I think that this would help us. And we talk a lot about empowerment, but we need to better understand that there's enormous diversity among different populations. And there are those of us who still suffer from mental health problems, but we are too often labeled as crazy. But I think that any kind of insanity, any kind of mental health problem needs to be better understood. So this then is a bit of a description of what occurred to me. And I would hope that my experience, which was negative, may help others so that they don't go through what I did, especially when it comes to children and adolescents. So if all of those who are connected, all 260 some odd participants, I hope that you reach out to users of services and have the experience of being with them and talking to them. And I hope that you continue to provide guidance and for different institutions. And I hope that this message reaches those who are connected. And I hope I've been clear. But in any case, this is what I wanted to say. And I hope you receive the message that this violation of the rights of children and adolescents and mental health services is something that we need to look into so that we don't have these violations. I know there are different situations in every country, but we must always take into account human rights. And this is essentially what I wish to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivia, for joining us, for sharing your experience and for your very valuable message to the participants today. It's very important to work together so that we can promote 
human rights of those who have mental health problems. So Olivia, thank you once again. Very well. Now, after hearing about one person's experience, we're going to look at the different tools we have to better protect human rights in human health. So now we're going to show a virtual course developed by PAHO, which refers to the protection and promotion of human rights in mental health with psychosocial support in an emergency context. And I give the floor to Carmen Martinez. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen and here you can see the presentation and a good day to all. But the fact of the matter is that for some time we wanted to move ahead with this question of promoting human rights and mental health. And we've now had an opportunity to work with some additional resources. And so I am now going to present the course as well as some other resources we have. But I would especially like to thank Olivia because I met her some years ago. And I believe that her story, her experience, as well as the story of many others needs to be communicated. But I think that the way she communicates her story is an opportunity for all of us who have not known her or heard her. I believe it reflects what many say, the majority, and it indicates what we need to do in practice. And it certainly shows that we have much work ahead. So once again, thank you, Olivia. Now, this virtual course on self-learning, a self-learning course, this is a part of the Public Health Department of PAHO, and it's on the protection and promotion of human rights as part of a response to so psychosocial approaches. First of all, we refer to the principles and tools to promote a quality approach, and it is based on human rights. The response is in regard to emergencies and mental health and psychosocial support. And so first we look at the general goals, but more concretely because of how relevant emergencies are, we felt that it was important to provide a number of important elements. So we'll go into it a little more concretely. So here we have the objectives, the goals. First of all, we want to recognize the concepts and principles of human rights that would apply to psychosocial support in an emergency situation. We also need to identify any aspect related to stigma, because this has also been emphasized as it was by Olivia, and how these persons are affected by stigma. And here the idea is to see how we can better protect and promote their rights. We also wish to recognize how we can apply the rights in a community and this is one of the main focuses. And we're looking at people who have mental health problems in a situation of emergency. We also look at the tools, the basic tools, so that these can be used at the workplace. And lastly, we need to identify essential actions when it comes to quality and human rights for psychosocial support and how these basic tools can be used so that we really put into place the actions. Now, who are the users of the course? We have a broad range. We hope it will assist anybody who is working in a humanitarian emergency situation. Psychosocial support today is something 
that we see as a cross-cutting theme in any emergency situation. And so having basic knowledge on these principles is fundamental so that we can ensure that we are being consistent in terms of protecting rights. Now, the methodology of the course, the course goes for anyone who registers on the platform. This is a virtual campus and anyone can sign up at any moment. And so this is a platform that can be used on a computer, a tablet, a phone, and it allows for downloading content. And we're going to hear more about that from Karina, about the virtual campus. And there are a number of tools and learning material, which can also be downloaded to make the learning more effective. We have three modules. And what is important is that these modules need to be looked at in order consecutively, because each one of the contents is based on prior modules. And so this becomes a basis. Now, the course is available, both in English and Spanish. Now, the structure of the content itself, as I mentioned, the modules cover eight topics. The first goes to the basics of human rights in mental health in situations of emergency. We talk about what we call SMAPs, this is mental health and emergency. Then we refer to the rights of those who have mental health problems in emergencies. The second module goes to priority focuses. So he, we look at rights of the persons and during a situation of emergency, and we look at the juridical protections and we look at what occurs when there's a violation of human rights. And the third module looks at specific actions in mental health and psychosocial support. And we look at essential actions and we have those as part of mental health. And we look at how to respect the quality of mental health and support systems always with the pyramid for the learning process and everything that we learn about mental health in emergencies and concrete actions that can be taken either at level one or at the level levels when we look at services, when we look at community support and focused support, which may not necessarily focus on mental health and lastly, specialized services. So the course is uh, about seven hours total. It's broken down by two hours approximately per module. So in order to obtain the course certification, participants need to, as I said, complete all three modules and they need to respond to the question of relating to the evaluations over covering each topic. And they have a final uh, questionnaire of 25 questions. Once you've gotten to that final uh, survey, about 70% of, and you get a 70% score, then you will be considered to have passed the course, the certification course in public health. So basically, this is everything I wanted to share in terms of the content of the virtual campus. Well, good morning. Catherine, I need to share my screen. We'll do that right now. I think you're ready now to share your screen. Good morning. I am Macarina Rodriguez, and I'm a technical advisor in the um, 
virtual campus. And I'd like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, online event. So the protection and promotion of uh, human rights in mental health and psychosocial support emergencies course is basically offered in two languages, in English and Spanish. You can select, uh, once you get into the virtual campus, your language of preference and per the corresponding slide presentations. So this is our website. You can uh, get in into the virtual campus and uh, you if you don't have a an account then you need to register and with a new account you need to provide your personal data including your name your place of residence your uh, all of the data where you work this is all confidential but we require all of this content in order to open up an account for you. We then uh, come up with a um, basically a record of all of the staff and uh, persons who are participating in the, uh, this is all confidential information. Once we've created, once you've joined the virtual campus, you will then move to this section, the uh, self-learning and self-study courses, and then you will go first to this tab. This is the protection and promoting of a human rights tab. That's for the Spanish version, the self-study course. If you would like to take the course in English, then go to the top and just select at the very top on the right-hand corner, you can select the English version and you will get right back into this uh, tab relating to the uh, self-study course on human rights. Once you have completed the course, as Carmen already stated, first you need to go through each one of the modules so that one by one you complete them. Once you've completed them, then after you've uh, filled out a quality survey, then you, you see, for example, seven uh, total hours. And then once you've uh, passed, it's also important that once you receive the passing grade, that is the score. Even if you go back and do a second or third time to try to get a higher score, it's not going to change. If you got an 80% score in the first test or evaluation with that, that is the, the score that you will get as you receive your certification or, or your the certificate can be downloaded just going into the qr code or just go down to this code on the bottom of the participation certificate uh, slide you can also if you need any assistance if you forgot your password word for example in your account or if anything else needs to be addressed in your account, you can just get in touch with the help desk. And it's uh, right over here, the address, so that you can get a response or any assistance to any challenges or issues that may have arisen in your virtual campus journey. Let me also mention that over the next few weeks, we are going to be upgrading our applications in the uh, virtuous, virtual campus. And any participant that has any connectivity issues or you're having difficulty accessing certain content, as long as you're on the internet, you can download all of the content. And once 
you reconnect to the internet, the content will be updated. All you need to do is then conduct or go through the evaluation. And then you can fill your survey and you will be able to download the participation certificate. So then all of the participants, I think it's going to be very user friendly for everyone. You can uh, always, if you have any needs, please request assistance from our help desk. Any questions? Karina, I think if it's okay, we're going to leave the questions for the end of the session. Thank you, Karina. Now let's continue with a very brief presentation. Karina, we need to get out and let the other presentation upload. Okay, so even if I have my presentation in, in Spanish, I will continue with this uh, with this small presentation in English. It's about other resources, not just uh, the virtual course that we are launching today, but other resources that are more um, uh, more related to the protection and the promotion of human rights in mental health not only for emergencies, but for regular situations as well. So we have a very newly created uh, website. You can see here, uh, which are the links in Spanish and in English as well. And in this website where we are um, including the key information that we consider from PAHO for the protection and promotion of the human rights in mental health. So we have key, uh, key facts regarding the, the situation, as well as the approaches that we are considering. In that sense, um, it is important to mention that uh, community-based um, approach, as well as the recovery-oriented um, actions and uh, the institutionalization, uh, and with this, uh, we mean the uh, transition from psychiatric hospital model to those alternative resources that are a community based, uh, even if they are residential, um, are those that are key approaches for uh, considering the protection and the promotion of human rights in mental health. Then in the same website, we have uh, some fact, a fact sheet where uh, we have the key tools and the strategies that we can uh, put in place uh, through the governments and through those um, actions that can be done at local and national level to, uh, to protect um, human rights and mental health. And, um, and we have also in this website uh, a bit of the PAHO response nowadays, that it's linked, of course, to all these resources that we are mentioning, but to the, uh, the, the, the role of uh, the advice that we are uh, providing to countries, to our member states, to ensure that we are advancing in this uh, protection of human rights. We are sharing as well in the website the, the key resources that we consider, of course, those international standards for human rights, as we uh, as we know, it would be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also the the, the CRPD or the Convention for uh, the Rights of Persons uh, Living with uh, Disabilities. Then a very important uh, document um, that is uh, quite new as well from WHO is those is this one about the orientations and the technical modules for the community-based uh, services in mental health. And it's a, a, a kit of several documents that are going to very specific situations of violations of human rights, uh, how we can to, to address that um, at local and national uh, level. 
There is also an important document that it's uh, the quality rights uh, document from WHO, and it goes together with one of the instruments for assessing the situation of the human rights in, in different services and structures. Um, for the 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 the, the thirty year the, after the thirty years of the of the of the Caracas Convention, um, we also launched the, the Institute's generalization of psychiatric care in Latin America and the Caribbean document that go, gives uh, proper guidance about how to advance in this change in the model from the uh, old uh, psychiatric hospitals to the, this community based. Um, approach. Then we have, of course, the, our uh, recent policy for improving mental health from PAHO, uh, very recently approved, um, as well as the uh, global WHO action plan for mental health that goes until 2030. And um, we have other resources as well, but these were the, the key ones. And it was, uh, it, was, it was important to select those that, uh, that were um, the most uh, predominant. As uh, we have just shared with you, we have uh, the virtual course that we have here in the middle is the one on the protection and, and promotion of human rights for the response in MHPSS, mental health and psychosocial support uh, in emergencies um, that we have just uh, described. But then there is a very important resource that goes a bit more in line on this approach in the general regular situations of mental health, that it's a uh, the, the quality and rights um, virtual course uh, that you will have all these links in our website. And another one we wanted to mention is uh, the one for understanding and acting against the stigma in, in mental health in the context uh, of health. Um, but we would also like to mention that we have uh, several uh, virtual courses as well as other resources in our, uh, in our virtual campus and, and in our website um, that can be very helpful as well to, to, to advance and to improve in some of the uh, key elements um, for, for mental health. So um, this was uh, what we wanted to, to share with you about the resources. So please, uh, Katerina, pass you the word. Yes. Thank you so much, Carmen, for sharing these tools and resources. Very useful. And um, now we have some minutes left for questions and answers. Uh, I saw many comments on the chat, but I will go directly to, to the concrete questions that we have. So um, for the ones that did not write the questions, you can still do it. And I will um, then start with one of these questions. Um, Pueden participar estudiantes de psicología en el curso. Can uh, students of uh, psychiatric studies, can they also participate in the study? Can you respond, Carmen? Yes, of course. The course, as we indicated, is a self-study course and anyone can join. You just have to register in the virtual course, as Karina indicated. And I mentioned that for any uh, healthcare psychiatric healthcare professional, I think it would be very beneficial to, to enroll in the course to get a clear understanding of many of the issues that are covered. So you're more than welcome, all of you, all of your students in uh, psychiatric studies. Then there's another one. How do we get this certificate? Is this information already available on the uh, website? And I can respond. Yes, the information relating to the course is contained on the website and uh, and also how to get your certificate this is in again the um, paho website on he mental health there's another comment and this has to do with in um, large cities you see people with uh, conditions where although they don't have any background in violence there are moments that when they have uh, perhaps some issues, they may hurt other people. That's a topic of conversation. So what are some of the discussions going on regarding this situation? Is it possible through healthcare systems prevent these types of uh, events from occurring? Let me just offer a comment on that. 
I think it requires additional time, but I think it's important that we, first of all, we be clear, is that there's clear evidence that there is no more violence committed by people with uh, mental health issues. And there's a lot of myths and a lot of uh, stigma regarding the use of violence, and in particular with people uh, who are homeless, for example. Obviously, as with just with other people, with other uh, mental health issues or healthcare issues in general, when they don't have access to adequate um, care, then we may see some of these behavior patterns are things that need to be looked at closely, but it, a main paradigm is to take into account that what's essential for someone to lead a normal life, just like anyone else, is that they get access to the treatment that they require in order to uh, maintain themselves um, uh, healthy and fit and have their needs covered. And these issues of behavior patterns and conflicts need to be well taken care of and addressed. Thank you very much, Carmen, for that comment, your response. So now we're just about at the end of our time. So allotment. So we have two additional questions here. Are there, is there any particular order that these courses should be uh, completed in? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, certainly recently we are launching many courses on mental health on the virtual campus. Many of these are being developed, which are programs for tutoring. And these go often to specific topics, and we work on these with the counterparts in the countries. But they are open to anyone. And sometimes it's difficult to choose. So it's also difficult for us to give you an order of recommended courses. But certainly you need to look at what your objective is in terms of the courses. For instance, if we basically work in emergency context, then I would certainly say that the course which we have launched today would be very important. However, there are some other courses in English and Spanish on our website, which may be more general on mental health and psychosocial support and interventions. This is also important. And also any kind of psychological first aid is important. We also have some that focus on the humanitarian assistance in order to provide care from the very first level within a humanitarian context. So if we're in a different area of work, we have many other resources which you can look at on our website. Thank you very much, Carmen. So we seem to have come, we're coming close to the end of our time and we have a final question. Are there any documents that refer to alternative housing for those with mental health issues? And do you have anything on gender focus? Microphone is, was muted, now it's on. Now, in the document which I sent you on institutionalization for Latin America and the Caribbean, we refer to alternatives to institutionalization. And this can provide information on different possibilities which may be put into place in the countries. And we always want to include gender as a cross-cutting question. The same as when it comes to ethnicity and the protection of rights. So I think that, yes, there are many ways of responding to what you have asked. Well, once again, Carmen, thank you very much for answering all of these questions. Now we are coming to the end. 
And thank you one and all for joining us, for participating and for being interested and committed to this important task. Now, you know where the resources are available. There are many, fortunately. So now all we need to do is read, learn and implement. Now, once again, any thanks and Carmen, I don't know if you have some final words. Uh, once again, Olivia, I would also like to thank Fahmi, Renato, Karina, all of you for participating today. I believe we have a significant challenge before us so that we can promote and protect human rights and mental health in the Americas. We have resources. We know it's a difficult path, a gradual path but we're here to support you so that we can all move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, and may you all have a good day.